Hi folks, it's me, Mr. Lang, and I wanted to take this opportunity to go over a little bit of the information around population ecology. Uh, you either have or will be shortly doing a simulation called Habitable Planet that has to do with population ecology, and I want you to have some, some basis for doing that um, and some understanding around those ideas. So I wanted to start by talking about some of the big terms and ideas that pop up in ecology. Uh, the first thing I should do is probably define what ecology is. And basically, when we're talking about ecology, we're talking about organisms and how organisms interact with their environment and with each other within a given environment. So if we look uh, down here, we've got all these different levels that we can look at ecology within. So we've got an individual, we could look at how that individual interacts with other individuals. We could look at how it interacts with more than just its own species. We could look at how it interacts with everything in a given ecosystem or um, a biome or the entire world. So. And we have all of these different levels. I'm going to go through most of them in a moment just to talk about what they're all about, but realize there's a whole bunch of different levels that we can look at ecology on. Before I start, let me also say that you should be taking notes right now. So um, we can, you can pause the video, take a second, get some notes out, and uh, go for some paper out. You can start writing, and that paper should sit in your notebook, and it should stay there until the end of the class. So here we go. Uh, ecosystem. So when we're looking at ecosystems, we are looking at a community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. So in this pond, we've got some fish, we have lily pads, we have frogs, we have turtles. Um, around the pond, we have deer, we have raccoons, we have, um, <clears throat> we have some aquatic plants, um, we have ferns, we have all these things that are interacting. That's an ecosystem, all of those things interacting. So that's kind of a big level. Um, we could also have a field ecosystem or a lake ecosystem or um, like a temperate forest ecosystem, which is what most of Vermont has. So those are the sorts of things that we could be talking about there. Uh, when we're looking at the next level, we've got a community, and that is a group of interacting species that are living in the same space. So here we've got some trees and some shrubs, and there's probably a few animals in there too. Um, and again, you probably shouldn't be writing all of these things down, you can if you'd like, but if you can take a second to think about what this means and summarize it, it'll make a lot more sense when you come back to it later. Um, a population, this is sort of interesting, um, this is where we've got a group of individuals that are all from the same species who live in the same area and are there at the same time and that can and do reproduce with each other. So in this group, we've got a whole bunch of giraffes. Now, we're not going to take this picture in uh, Vermont. We'd be taking this somewhere on the savannah or something like that in Africa. But um, if this was in Vermont, maybe that would be a, a herd of white-tailed deer. They don't, we don't have huge herds, but we, we definitely have groups of 18 to 20 that gather sometimes, especially in the winter. So, um, so those are, that's a population of zebra. And then um, another term that's really important for us to know the uh, definition of is habitat. And that is where something lives and everything that it does interacts with, everything that, um, everything that it has an effect on. Um, and there's four components of habitat. And those are food, shelter, water, and space. And as long as an organism or a species has all of those four things, it's going to increase in population. So if I have enough food, enough shelter, enough water, and enough space, I will have an increase in population. And that's important to think about. If I'm lacking one of those things, I'm not going to increase in population as quickly. That's also important when we get to the next ideas. So if we were to think about some different ecosystems, um, we might ask ourselves, well, why isn't the savanna overrun with elephants or zebra? Why isn't our football field at CHS overrun with crabgrass or daisies for that matter? Why isn't Lake Champlain overrun with milfoil or zebra mussels or lake trout or bass or minnows or anything else? Everything's kind of in a balance, right? Um, why is everything in nature in a balance? How, how does it maintain that? Well, the way that it maintains it is <clears throat> through 
this idea of limiting factors. Um, and before we talk about those, we should probably talk about how growth occurs in populations. So there's this, this fellow by the name of Thomas Mathis who explained that, um, or either noticed or explained that if you have ideal conditions, that's you have enough food, shelter, water, and space, that you will experience exponential growth as a species. Um, and Darwin went a little further than that even, and he said that, uh, we'll talk about Darwin a lot this year, um, he said, or he, he extrapolated that um, if you have all your limiting factors met, that two elephants could reproduce. And elephants realize when an elephant reproduces with an elephant, um, the female elephant is pregnant for 22 months and usually has just one calf. Uh, and then they have a whole year where they don't have any calves and then they have another one, which takes two years basically. So it's kind of slow reproduction. But what he said was if there's enough resources, there's enough food, shelter, water, and space, two elephants will equal up to 19 million elephants in 750 years. Um, so that's as long as there's no drought, no predators, no disease, no lack of food or shelter. If we go all that time with none of those things happening, which is pretty impossible, um, then the population is going to be huge. Now, they don't live to be 750 years old. They live to be about 80 years old, but you get the idea. Um, so limiting factors are the reason why there is an uncontrolled growth. So let me go back to the slide real quickly. So this is what, what Malthus was saying. He was saying that our population is going to reach a certain point where it can really take off. And until we lack food, shelter, water, or space, we're gonna have we're gonna have exponential growth, which is sort of what the human species is experiencing right now. Um, so limiting factors. There's lots of limiting factors out there. They're things that slow the growth of population. In the next slide, I'm going to show you some examples of that. But um, so there are biotic factors, which are things that are alive. Biotic, B-I-O, biotic, bio, that means life. So things that are alive, like if I don't have enough food or if there's lots of predators trying to eat me or if there's lots of other species or even my own species competing for resources and I'm not as good at competing for those resources, then they're going to get the food and I'm not. Disease, if I'm getting if I'm getting either killed or or hurt by disease, I'm not going to be able to survive as well as something else maybe. Mates, if I can't find a mate, I can't reproduce and if I can't reproduce, I can't have babies and my species will not grow. Abiotic factors, if you put an A in front of anything scientific, it means without. So this is non-living or without life factors. Space, if I don't have enough space for my species, we're not going to reproduce unchecked in that exponential way. Climate, if there's not enough temperature, if the temperature is too low or too high, or there's not enough light for the photosynthetic organisms to produce sugars for us to eat, or if there's not enough water or wind or whatever, based on my species, I'm not going to reproduce as well. And then also if there's just not enough resources like shelter and minerals and geology, and some, <clears throat> some of those could be biotic as well. So hope you get the idea there. So limiting effects, uh, limiting factors affect carrying capacity. So the carrying capacity is literally just the maximum number of a particular species that can be supported by a particular habitat. So it might be the number of deer that can be supported in a certain field, eco field ecosystem, or um, it might be the number of lake trout that can be supported by Lake Champlain, or bass in Lake Champlain or something like that. And as the environment changes, that capacity to, to support individuals changes as well. So as we look at carrying capacity, here's the deal. Um, all populations, if there's enough food, shelter, water, and space, so enough resources, will experience exponential growth. So if we look at this graph, we can see that we've got just logistic growth, normal growth here. And then all of a sudden right here, our population is high enough and our resources are available enough that the population just shoots up. So from about here down to here, that's exponential growth. This area right here where it's a really, really steep curve, okay? And then we see that it starts to limit out. Well, why is it limiting out? It's limiting out because of those limiting growth factors. So maybe there's not enough food, or maybe there's not enough shelter, or maybe there's not enough space, or maybe there's more predators now, or or maybe there was a forest fire and there's not um, 
and there's not as many plants to eat for a rabbit or something like that. So, um, so it's important to realize that we're not going to experience exponential growth forever. And at some point, the population is going to start to limit itself out based on lack of resources. And we call that lack of resources limiting factors. Now, the way that that really shows itself in nature isn't this like real nice, even linear curve. But what happens is we have that quick shoot up exponential growth. And then we have this little area called overshoot. So let's pretend we're talking about rabbits in an area. So we've got plenty of grass for the rabbits to eat, plenty of plants for the rabbits to eat, water, space, shelter here, all that stuff. Well, the first thing we're probably going to run out of if we have lots and lots and lots of rabbits in a given area is we're probably going to run out of small herbaceous, small herbaceous plants like grasses and things like that. So what's going to happen is the population is going to continue to shoot up and somewhere in here, the resource is going to start running out. Well, the rabbits aren't going to all die at once, but some of them are going to start to die out after that happens. And once a bunch of them die out, well, some of the grasses will grow back and then the rabbit population will be able to go up and then they'll overeat the grass again a little bit. And then the rabbit population will die down and then the grasses will grow back. And you can see how we'll just keep having more rabbits or less rabbits based on environmental conditions. And that is, um, that's basically what will keep on happening until some change happens in the environment. And somewhere right in the middle of that, well, that's what we call the carrying capacity for that area. And then maybe there's a fire that goes across that grassland area or the forest area. And all of a sudden, the carrying capacity, there would be way less grass for rabbits to eat for a while. Their population isn't just going to go down a little bit. Their population is going to go down a lot. And one of the neat things about this is when their population goes down, guess which rabbits survive? It's the rabbits that compete for the resource the best, which means that we're going to start we're going to start limiting out the rabbits that aren't as good at competing for the resources. And the rabbit species as a whole, as we go through this process, is sort of improved genetically to be the ones that are the best at getting and using resources. So that's sort of a neat evolutionary idea that we're going to come back to later on. Um, and that's pretty much all that I wanted to say in this video. Again, you didn't need to take notes on absolutely everything, but you should have all the terms and some ideas around what those terms are written down because this stuff is definitely gonna show up on our first quizzes and tests. Um, the last thing I've got here is when is a bathtub, a habitat like a bathtub? It's just a, an infographic that you can look at. Um, and all of the things that we just talked about are sort of represented here. So we have inputs to population, so we've got anything that's born or moves into the area. And then here's our population, that's the, that's the water. And our habitat is how many organisms our environment can support. Capaci carrying capacity is the rim of the bathtub. So if there's anything, any population over the rim of the bathtub, well, that's gonna spill out and it's gonna spill out into the drain and then that's going to be added to population losses um, due to pollution or starvation or predators or weather or old age or accidents or hunting. All of those things can lead to, to, to death, including overpopulation. So hopefully this was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions uh, when I see you in class and have a great day.